My name is Linda Spilker. I work at the Jet Propulsion Laboratory in Pasadena, California. I'm the Cassini Project Scientist. I got my bachelor's degree in physics at Cal State Fullerton and then went on to get my PhD at UCLA in geophysics and space physics. And I've, I've always been fascinated with space. I can tell you to this day where I was when Neil Armstrong landed on the moon. And so that intrigued me and I went on to study space and the planets in particular. And I started out working on Voyager back in 1977 and got to watch as Voyager flew by Jupiter, Saturn, Uranus, and Neptune. And during that time I had two daughters and I tell them, Jennifer and Jessica, that their births were based on the alignment of the planets. And what I mean is that there was a five-year window between the Voyager flybys of Saturn and of Uranus. And so in that five-year window is when I and a number of Voyager moms started their families. Uh, my passion is planetary rings. I work on Cassini, which is in orbit around Saturn. We've been there eight years, and Saturn's rings are just fascinating to me. Uh, they're very paper thin, only a few meters thick, made out of primarily water ice particles. Typical sizes are a millimeter to a few centimeters, although there's some particles that are the size of houses or even the size of mountains and much bigger. So primarily of water ice with a little bit of non-icy contaminant that we're trying to learn about and understand. Saturn's rings have very simple names, just the letters of the alphabet. Uh, so the main rings that you could see through a telescope would be A, B, and C. In close to Saturn is the D ring. You hop out, outside the A ring is a very narrow F ring, and then we have the E ring and the G ring. So very simple names for the rings. The main rings, we think, uh, could have either formed at the same time as Saturn did, or perhaps, if they're young enough, maybe a comet came in close to Saturn was torn apart by Saturn's gravity and went on to form the ring particles. We don't know the answer because we're not sure how much material or how much mass is inside of Saturn's rings. And we hope by the end of the Cassini mission to be able to answer some questions about the origin, perhaps, of Saturn's ring system. Uh, the ring particles have a lot of structure in them. They have resonances with tiny moons that orbit just outside. And these resonances, for instance, if the moon goes around once, and a ring particle goes around twice, that location where they go around exactly twice is a resonance. Energy can go into the ring and creates spiral density waves, bending waves, and some of the beautiful structure that you've seen if you've looked carefully at Saturn's rings. I study the rings in the thermal infrared. That means you measure the temperature of the ring particles. We watch as the ring particles go in and out of Saturn's shadow. And we notice that they cool off very quickly and they heat up very quickly when they come back out. So that means that their thermal inertia, the measure of how they can absorb or emit heat, is very, very low. In fact, if you could hold a ring particle in your hand, it would probably look like a fluffy snowball. Very puffy, porous ice on the outside that can cool off and heat up quickly, although the core might be more like a solid ice cube. We're not sure what the cores look like, because all we can really see and measure is the outside surfaces of the ring particles. The ring particles uh, sometimes group together in clumps. They stick together into long clumps that we call self-gravity wakes. In the A and the B rings, we see a lot of this clumping going on. Very interesting phenomena in the rings. One of my favorite rings is a very tenuous, dusty ring called the E ring. And it's interesting because the source of that ring is a tiny moon Enceladus. Enceladus is only about 300 kilometers in diameter. And there's a series of tectonic fractures we've nicknamed tiger stripes because that's kind of what they look like at the South Pole. Out of these fractures are coming these jets and plumes of material, water vapors coming out and freezing, water ice particles. We see carbon dioxide, carbon monoxide. We even see salts in the particles closer to the surface of Enceladus. So there's a liquid water reservoir underneath the surface providing this material that goes around then and forms the E-ring that shares the orbit with Enceladus and sort of spreads out through the Saturn system. And with a liquid water reservoir, we wonder, might that be a habitat for potential life? So the astrobiologists are very interested in places like Enceladus that have a liquid water reservoir. Uh, Cassini has a lot of interesting things in store. We have another five years to its mission. We'll be ending our mission in 2017, where we'll take the spacecraft and go between the innermost ring, the D ring, and the top of Saturn's atmosphere, orbit very close to the planet, learn a lot about the interior structure of Saturn, measure its magnetic field, its gravity field, get the mass finally for the rings so that we'll know 
how did they form and evolve their origin of the rings, and then finally, Cassini will go into Saturn's atmosphere, and that will be the end of our mission. So lots of great things in store for Cassini. Stay tuned. For the origin of Saturn's rings, there's two possibilities. It could have formed at the same time as Saturn did, if it's massive enough to have lasted the processes that slowly erode away the rings. The second idea is that perhaps a comet or a moon in the Saturn system came in too close to Saturn, torn apart by Saturn's gravity, and goes on to form a ring. The rings are inside what we call the Roche limit. That's the limit outside of which you can coalesce and form moons, but inside of which you can't take the particles together and grow anything that's very large. So Saturn's rings are primarily inside of what's called the Roche limit. Material is added to the rings through probably dust that comes through, passed through a comet tail, micrometeoroids, or larger particles. So we've seen evidence that things slam into a ring particle, breaks it apart, creates a little cloud that we've actually seen. Uh, we, we viewed the rings edge on at equinox, the sun shining edge on to the rings. So the only light source then is the reflected light coming from Saturn. And so the rings are very dark and it's really cool because anything that sticks up above or below the rings casts a shadow. So it gave us a chance to probe for three-dimensional structures in Saturn's rings. And we actually saw in several places where the rings were sticking up. There's a tiny moon Daphnis orbiting in the Keeler gap and along the edges of the gap, since Daphnis's orbit is slightly tipped, slightly inclined with respect to the rings, created these beautiful structures of waves along the rings that stuck four kilometers above, looking kind of like giant mountain peaks along the sides of the rings. So that was a very interesting time to probe Saturn's rings. Uh, Saturn has a large moon named Titan. Titan is about the size of the planet Mercury. If Titan had formed elsewhere in our solar system, it would have been a planet in its own right. Titan is the only moon in the solar system with a thick atmosphere, mostly nitrogen with other hydrocarbons in it like methane, ethane, acetylene, propane, etc. in the atmosphere. What's unique about Titan is the temperature of Titan about minus 290 Fahrenheit is at the triple point or the temperature with methane can be a liquid, a gas, or a solid. So we have weather on Titan. We have methane clouds. It rains methane onto the surface of Titan and the liquid methane fills the lakes primarily at the north polar region of Titan. So it's a very unique uh, chemistry going on in the atmosphere as well as on the surface. And Titan is a very Earth-like world. It has river channels, lakes. It even has dunes in the equatorial region which we think is drier, similar to like the Earth. So we see the structures of these dunes around Titan. Titan is interesting because methane is a greenhouse gas and it's what keeps the atmosphere of Titan warm enough. And, but methane is very light. It goes to the top of the atmosphere. The sun breaks it apart, and it can form longer chain hydrocarbons. So what that means is over a short time, geologically speaking, the methane could be depleted in Titan's atmosphere unless there's a source of methane to resupply it. And so what's intriguing is we think there may be evidence for possible cryovolcanism on Titan. Water ice volcanoes with maybe ammonia like an antifreeze in it, and perhaps with that water comes methane to replenish the atmosphere. There's structures that look remarkably similar to some of the volcanic structures we see here on the Earth. So Titan is a very intriguing place. Cassini actually carried a probe named Huygens, supplied by the European Space Agency, and Huygens landed on the surface of Titan and actually made measurements of the surface. It, Huygens was warm compared to the surface, so it evaporated some gases. It went into one of our instruments, the gas chromatograph mass spectrometer, which measured the composition. Of course, saw a lot of methane in with that composition as well. Yeah, Saturn's a very interesting place. Uh, we, we saw a giant storm, something that only happens once every 30 years, totally encircling the planet, and watched as that storm developed and is now dissipated. Uh, Saturn also has something very unusual. It has a hurricane at its north pole, but that hurricane has a hexagon shape. So rotating at about 77 degrees north latitude is a six-sided hexagon. Why it keeps those straight sides, we really have no good idea. We see sort of streamers coming off of the edges. The hexagon was first seen by the Voyager spacecraft in the 1980s, and it's still there today. So why it maintains its shape, what keeps it going, we're just not sure.